story consists of my recollections of a very unusual young man with whom I was thrown into contact at long intervals. In the summer of 1919, while passing through Chicago on my way to the Far East, a friend of mine, Elliot Templeton, whom I had known in London and Paris, invited me to dine with him and his sister, Mrs. Bradley. We were giving a dinner party at one of those sprawling country clubs, which was so much a part of the American scene in the early days of the post-war boom. ...to the customs of his country. Ah, here's my niece now. Oh, Mother. Hello, Isabel. Hello. Mr. Morm, this is my daughter, Isabel. How do you do, How do you Mr. Do? Morm? Where's Larry? Late. Oh, poor sweet. I suppose he forgot to wind his watch last night, as usual. You wouldn't know about Larry. Say, Mother, you know you've mixed up the cards. Oh, I think Sophie, we can... dear. Hello, sir. This is Sophie Nelson, Mr. Somerset Moore. Sophie's a neighbor of ours in the country. Look. How do you do? You look charming, Sophie. Yes, oh. doesn't she? Excuse us? Come here. I want to have a look at you. Sophie, you look lovely. It's the dress. Are you sure you don't mind my wearing it? Of course not. If you'd like it, take it as a present. Oh, Isabel, that's awfully sweet of you. Such a surprise for Bob to see me decently dressed for once. Oh, you know Bob's much too much in love with you to notice what you wear. He's no more crazy about me than I am about him. I don't think anyone ever loved anyone as I love him. Isn't it heavenly to be alive? Hi. Hello, Gray. Hello, Gray. May I break this up? Sure. Hello. You look lovely. Think so? Hello, Sophie. Hello. May I get you one, Miss, um, Miss Nelson, isn't it? Yes, Sophie Nelson. Mm -hmm. I'd love it. Uh, oh, no, I guess I'd better not. Why, what's wrong with cocktails? Oh, nothing. Only I, I promised Bob I wouldn't. Who's Bob? My boyfriend. 
He doesn't like you to drink. He thinks I'm too fond of him. Which is Bob? Oh, he isn't here. He's working. He's putting himself through law school. But he's going to drop in later and take me home. Will you have one of these? If my man Joseph could see me now, I give you my word, he'd faint dead away. <laughs> You're a great friend of Mr. Templeton's, aren't you? Well, I wouldn't say that. Edward has no friends, only acquaintances. Where is Mr. Moore? Oh, Evidently, Larry hasn't learned that punctuality is the politeness of kings. Elliot, uh, Mr. Moore, this is Larry Darrell. Uh, Louisa, when can we start dinner? Mr. Moore's a novelist, darling. Oh? I may as well tell you that Larry's very stupid and uneducated. He knows nothing about anything except flying. But when he came back, he looked so lovely in his uniform, I camped on his doorstep until he consented to marry me. The competition was awful. Don't believe a word she says, Mr. Moore. Isabel's not a bad girl, really, but she's a terrible liar. Dinner. <laughs> Oh. oh, yes. I've seen you before. Oh, when? I happened to have a job of work to do, and I went into the library. I saw you when I went in there early this morning, and when I came back from lunch, you were still there. But to tell you the truth, I forgot about lunch. I couldn't help admiring your power of concentration. Well, it was that kind of a book. My dear fellow, you're at the end of the table with my sister. Hello, Thank Gray. You, Gray. Hi there. Say, Dad tells me you turned on that job in the office. Oh, Larry, why have you done that? I thought it over, and, well, I figured I'd be a disappointment to Gray's father, so I decided I'd better refuse. Sorry, old man. It would have been swell, us working together.
Larry, why didn't you tell me that Mr. Matcher had offered you a job? Answer. Answer me. Well, I thought I'd better not till I made up my mind one way or another. You mad? Darling, that's the horrible part about you. However aggravating you are, one can't really be angry with you. Oh, can't they? Did you see those looks Uncle Elliot was giving me at dinner? Well, after all, Larry, a man must work. And the longer you put it off, the harder it'll be. I've got a foolish notion I want to do more with my life than just sell bonds. All right, then. Go into a law office. No, I don't want to do that either. What do you want to do, then? I don't know. Loaf, maybe. Oh, Larry, don't be funny. This is serious. I'm not being funny. I think it's very serious. I wouldn't make you miserable for anything. But you are making me miserable. You see, I love you. Oh, and I love you, Isabel. Look, Larry, let's be sensible. A man must work. It's a matter of self-respect. This is a young country, and it's a man's duty to take part in its activities. My Gray's father was saying only the other day that we're beginning an era that will make the past look like 30 cents. He said that he can see no limit to our progress, and that by 1930, we'll be the greatest and richest country in the whole world. Don't you think that's terribly exciting? Terribly. Why, there never was such a chance for a young man. I, I'd have thought you'd be proud to be a part of it. It's such a wonderful adventure. I'm sure you're right, Isabel. The armors and the swifts will pack more and better meat. McCormick's will turn out more and better harvesters, and Henry Ford will make more and better cars, and everybody will get richer and richer. Then what's wrong with that? Nothing. Nothing at all. It, it just happens that sitting in an office and making a lot of money doesn't interest me as much as it should. Oh, Larry, don't talk like a fool. You can't live without money. But I have a little. That's what gives me the chance to do what I want. You're making it very difficult for me, Larry. I'm sorry, darling. I wouldn't if I could help it. You can help it. Yes? The dead look so terribly dead when they're dead. What does that mean, exactly? Just that. Are you terribly unhappy, darling? You know, the only thing that makes me unhappy is making you unhappy. I don't think I'll ever find peace until I make up my mind about things. It's so difficult to put into words. The minute you try, you feel embarrassed. You say to yourself, who am I to bother my head about this, that, or the other? Wouldn't it be better just to follow the beaten path and let what's coming to you come? And then I think of a guy I knew. A minute before, he was full of life and fun, and then he was dead. I've seen many men die, but this one was different. It was the last day of the war, almost the last moment. He could have saved himself, but he didn't. He saved me and died. So he's gone, and I'm here, alive. Why? It's all so meaningless. You can't help but ask yourself what life is all about. Whether there's any sense to it or whether it's just a stupid blunder. I hardly know what to say. It's, it's so unexpected. Larry, do you think it would help if you went away for a while? I think perhaps it would. Then why don't you go? Because of you.
Larry, let's be frank with each other. There's no place in your life for me just now. Does that mean you don't want to be engaged to me anymore? Oh, no, foolish. It means that I'm prepared to wait. Might be a year, or even longer. That doesn't matter. Might be less. Where have you thought of going? Where? Well, I thought I'd start by going to Paris. I went there several times on leave. I don't know why, but I've got it into my head that there, everything that's muddled in my mind would grow clear. It's a funny place. It gives you the feeling that you can think out your thoughts to the very end. I think over there I may be able to see my way before me. And if you don't? I'll give it up as a bad job. Come back to Chicago and take the first work I can get. for the life of me understand how Isabel could possibly prefer that young man to a fine chap like Gray. Oh, I grant you he's good-looking and his clothes fit. But imagine, an opportunity to go in with Gray and his father on the ground floor. Isabel. Oh, so early. Yes. What's the matter? Nothing. Where's Larry? Gone. Hello, Mother. Did you have a talk with him? Yes. May I venture to inquire the result? He's going to Europe for a while. I, I promised to wait for him. What in the world is he going to do in Europe? Loaf. Loaf? Don't be ridiculous, Isabel. That's what he told me. Really, I have no patience with you. If you had any spirit, you'd have broken off your engagement then and there. What can I do? I love him. Come along. It's all right. Well, things might be a great deal worse. Oh, thank heavens. Merci, Joseph. I was just saying, Louisa, things might be a great deal worse. Oh. Don't get up. I don't see how. My poor Louisa, you have no imagination. When you're young, your emotions are violent, but they're not durable. It's a delusion that absence makes the heart grow fonder. With Larry out of the way and Gray on the spot, I don't see why Isabel shouldn't marry him before the year's out. You've been away from America too long, Elliot. You've forgotten that in this country, a girl doesn't marry a man because her mother or even her uncle wants her to. That's nothing to be proud of, Louisa. As a result of 30 years' experience, I may tell you that a marriage arranged with the proper regard for position and fortune has every advantage over a love match. In France, which, after all, is the only civilized country in the world, Isabel would marry Gray without thinking about it twice. Then, after a few months, if she was still in love with Larry... That will do, Elliot. I know what you're going to say, and the idea doesn't appeal to me. That's one of the things I've never understood about you, Louisa. Though you've lived half your life in diplomatic society and half the capitals of the world, you've remained hopelessly American. It isn't often that you pay me a compliment, dear. It wasn't meant to be one. I know. <laughs> well, I think I'll go to bed. Elliot, will you lock up? Yes, dear. Good night, Mr. Moore. Good night. You're very full of worldly wisdom this evening, Elliot. Have you ever known me not to be? I don't mind telling you I have a sneaking sympathy for the boy. He's young and he wants to sow his wild oats before he settles down to married life. Very natural and very proper. I'll keep my eye on him in Paris. Of course, he must cross on the Aquitania. I know the captain and he'll see that Larry sits at his table and meets the right people. I look for an apartment for him in a really smart quarter. I'll do him proud. I'll give some parties for him. So many Americans, when they go to Paris, get him with the wrong people. And then they find it no end of a job to shake them off. I'll have my chauffeur, Marcel, drive him about in the roads. I detest the countryside. But alas, all Americans are born tourists, and no doubt he'll want to see the sights. It would be perfect if I could arrange for some older woman to take him under her wing. Princess Nove Malle, for instance. He is young, and he has a good figure. 
I think she'd fall for him like a ton of bricks. <laughs> In any event, the busier I keep him, the less time he'll have to think about Isabel. <laughs> Is it going to be tough? Oui, mademoiselle. Anything for Lawrence Darrell? This wireless came day before yesterday. Uh, Mr. Henderson tells Betty. They went through here about a year ago. Oh, excuse me. Pardon me. When does the boat train from the Aquitania arrive? 11.30. Thank you. Little belly on the Why, he'll course, He knew you were coming. Isabel cabled him from the ship. Are they still engaged? <laughs> as far as I know. What about Grey Matron? Still faithful. <laughs> I don't believe you played your cards very well, Louisa. I never had much card sense, Elliot. Yes. Mother, here he is. Oh, how good of you to come, Larry. So nice to see you, Mrs. Bradley. Hello, Mr. Templeton. How do you do? Uncle Elliot, may Larry come along to dinner with us? Uh, Larry's given me to understand he doesn't dine out. Oh, he will tonight, won't you? I will. Well, that's very good of you, I'm sure. I should be delighted. <laughs> we'll meet you at the house. Taxi? Taxi! Come along, Dan. I've got a million things to get you. I'm afraid I haven't a very good account to give you of that young man, Louisa. Oh? When he first came over to Paris, for Isabel's sake, I asked him to lunch, to meet the sort of people he ought to know. He told me he didn't eat lunch. Perhaps he doesn't. And then when I asked him to dinner, he said he couldn't come because he had no evening clothes. If I live to be a hundred, I shall never understand how any young man could come to Paris without evening clothes. Maybe he just didn't want to. That's the most incredible reason for refusing an invitation I've ever heard in my life. And where does he live? I haven't a notion. Isabel writes to him in care of the American Express. Like a traveling salesman or a school teacher on vacation. My own belief is that he's living in the Latin Quarter with some bit who's no better than she ought to be. I'm afraid you'd have to write him off as one of your failures, Elliot. It might surprise you to know it, my dear, but I've already done so. Bonjour, madame. Bonjour, mademoiselle. C'est le premier mai aujourd'hui. C'est une coutume française d'avoir du huguet. Ça porte bonheur et de l'amour. Oh. She speaks so quickly, I can't understand her. Well, she's telling you that it's an old French custom. Everyone has to wear a sprig of lilies of the valley on May Day. They're a symbol of happiness. <laughs> Merci, bon, madame. madame. Merci. May Day. Imagine it's being May. That means I've been here nearly a month now. Oh, impossible. It was only yesterday. I still don't know a thing about what you've been doing. Tell me, Larry. You must know I've been dying to know. Oh, nothing really very exciting. I've traveled around, read a lot, gone to lectures at the Sorbonne and so forth. Have you found that peace of mind you were looking for? No, but for the first time, I'm beginning to see things in a clear light. What does that mean? It's rather difficult to explain, and even if I try, you'll only be angry with me. But how much longer do you think all this is going to take you? I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say. And after that, what are you going to do with all this wisdom? If I ever acquire wisdom, I suppose I'll be wise enough to know what to do with it. You know what Uncle Elliot says? Nothing to my credit, I imagine. He says you have a cozy little hideout somewhere. Come and see for yourself. A cozy little hideout's only a step from here. Oh, bonjour, Etienne. Monsieur Darrell. Madame Duval, Mademoiselle Bradley. Oh, Monsieur Jacques Duval. Enchanté, Mademoiselle. It is 
see the looks they gave me. Ruin my character, that's what you've done. Is that out? This is where you live? You don't like it? No. Well, it's all right. It's convenient. How about a cup of coffee? Larry, how can you bear to sit here in a backwash when America's living through the most glorious adventure the world has ever known? You've been away a year now, a whole year out of your life. You just can't go on loafing forever. Or can you? It's possible. And what about me? Am I of no importance to you at all? Oh, you're of great importance to me, Isabel. I love you and I want you to marry me. When? In ten years? No, now, as soon as possible. On what? I've got $3,000 a year. Oh, Larry. Well, lots of people live on a great deal less. But I don't want to live on $3,000 a year. I never have and I don't see why I should. We could go down to Capri for our honeymoon. And then in the fall, we could go to Greece. Remember how we used to talk about traveling all over the world together? Of course I want to travel. But not like that. Cheap restaurants, third-rate hotels. Besides, I want to have babies, Larry. All right, darling, we'll take them along with us. Oh, Larry, you're so impractical. You don't know what you're asking me to do. I'm young. I want to have fun. Do all the things people do. We wouldn't have a friend in the world. Oh, Isabel, stop exaggerating. We'll do everything that you want to do, and we'll do it together. Oh, listen, darling. If you hadn't a cent to your name and got a job that brought you 3000 a year, I'd marry you without a minute's hesitation. I'd cook for you. I'd make beds. I wouldn't care what I wore. I, I'd think it was fun, because I'd know it was only a question of time until you'd make good. But this means living like this all our lives with nothing to look forward to. It's asking too much. Oh, Larry, you've had your fling now. For your own sake, I beg of you to come home with us. But I wouldn't make you happy if I did. You see, what you forget is that I want to learn as passionately as... Well, as Gray, for example, wants to make a lot of money. I came over here because I was restless and because my mind was muddled. I came looking for the answers to a lot of questions. Some of them I found. Others I may never find. But I can't stop now. Oh, I know it sounds vague and trivial compared with... Well, compared with everything that's happening at home today. And I know I'm being very difficult. But I can't stop now, Isabel. I just can't. But what would happen to America if everyone did as you're doing? Well, the answer to that is that everyone doesn't feel as I do. Fortunately for themselves, most people are just content to follow the normal course and take things as they are. Oh, I wish I could, too. But I know if I tried, I'd just make a mess of your life and of mine, too. But... What's this all going to lead to? I don't know. It may be that when I'm through, I will have found something to give that people will be glad to take. It's just a chance. But even if I fail, I shan't be any worse off than a fellow who's gone into business and hasn't made a go of it. Then there's nothing more to be said. Well, go on, go on. <laughs> I don't believe it. Louisa, dear, do you realize that in the two months you've been here, I haven't won a game? <laughs> Who's 
Who's winning? I am. Good. <laughs> well, I must say Isabel's taking it very well. Has she told you exactly what happened? Only that she and Larry talked it over and came to the conclusion they'd made a mistake. Has she written to Gray? I wouldn't know. I'm not in the habit of opening her mail. If you ask me, she's very well out of it. Of course, there's no doubt there was a strong physical attraction, but Here that's she all. Is. Good night, Mother. Good night, darling. Don't be too late. Remember, we have to catch the boat train in the morning. Well, you're very dressed up. You seem to be going somewhere. Yes. Where? Oh, nowhere in particular. Larry and I are going out on the town. Larry? We thought we'd like to spend our last night together. Evening, I trust you mean. I'm profoundly shocked. If he had any sense of decency, he'd never have asked you. But he didn't ask me. I asked him. You should forbid her to go, Louisa. Will you pay any attention to me if I do, Isabel? No, darling, none. In that case, I don't think there's any point in my forbidding it. Pretty dress she had on. I hadn't realized it was cut quite so low.
That was a brilliant performance, my dear. Uh, I left the door just a little open. Shall I get you a drink? I expect you want it. You think you're very clever, don't you? I don't think it. I know it. Come, come, child. Be reasonable. I guess you were up to something. Even your poor mother noticed the pains you went to to make yourself alluring tonight. You're hateful. But no fool, my angel. Am I right in surmising that you thought if you could get him to come back here, it was almost inevitable that the inevitable should happen? No one could put it more delicately. We know what the consequences may be when a poor girl strays from the narrow path of virtue. Do we? My guess is that if your unscrupulous plan had come off, it wouldn't have been long after you returned to Chicago before the wretched Larry got a letter from you, telling him to come back at once and make an honest woman of you. You can be wonderfully disagreeable when you like, Uncle Elliot. I know. It's one of my most cherished gifts. Why didn't you go through with it? When I looked into his eyes and saw he hadn't the slightest idea I'd set a trap for him, I couldn't bring myself to play such a dirty trick. I couldn't help myself. I suppose it was my better nature. Nonsense. It was your sound Middle Western horse sense. You'd have been mad to have married him. I wonder. Believe me. When you've put the Atlantic between you and that young man, you won't care two straws for him. Trust your Uncle Elliot. He's a very wise old party. Mr. Batron, the cake. John's fine. The Here's a knife, Mrs. Isabel. I mean, Mrs. Matterin. <laughs> what do I do with it? Hey, Gray, you get in there. You're in on this. I told you what to do, Isabel. Take her hand, Gray. Nothing would please me more. You know, darling, this is the nicest wedding I've ever been to. We should have thought of this sooner. <laughs> oh, Uncle Elliot, how do brides cut their cakes in France? With a knife, dear. <laughs> <laughs> now, make a wish, Gray. I don't have to. I've got my wish. <laughs> you know, I've never been able to understand why, when there's so much space in the world, people should deliberately choose to live in the Middle West. Hmm. What in heaven's name is this? Is it a loan? Does it come with something? What is it? It could be a pickle fork. A pickle fork? <laughs> Two ninety-eight, no doubt, at ye gifty shoppy. Four fifty, Mr. Templeton, at opened orphans. We know because we sent it. Charming. Is it for use or ornament? <laughs> Both. Uh, do you remember me? We met the last time as in Chicago. Oh, I most certainly do, Mr. Oh, Moore. Hello, sir. So. Oh, darling. How sweet of you and Bob to come. Let me see you. Oh, you look beautiful, Isabel. Think so? Like a million dollars. Or should I say 20 million? <laughs> Darling, we never see you and Bob anymore. Where in the world are you I never thought I'd get her, well, but I did. Just at present, for reasons best known to ourselves, we don't mix with the rich. And we find it too expensive. How's the kid, Bob? Fine. W would you like oh, to? Oh, please, sure. darling, not now. <laughs> I'd love to come in to see you. Where do you live now? In a walk-up apartment on the north side. I'd ask you and Greg to dinner, only I'm afraid you wouldn't care for my cooking. <laughs> don't you believe her. She's the best darn cook in Chicago. All's well that ends well. And I must say, they make a very attractive couple. Oh, yes. no. <laughs> I hope they'll be happy. Why shouldn't they be happy? They have everything in the world to make them happy. Money, position, a nice house. And Gray's father can't live forever. What about Larry? Have you heard anything about him lately? Good heavens, no. As soon as Isabel and Louisa went away, I dropped in like a hot potato. A most undesirable young man. I tried to find him the last time I was in Paris, but I couldn't. I wonder what's happened to him. Shall I tell you something, my dear fellow? I don't care a row of beans.
consomme est égal, si euh, je travaille toujours, je ne sors jamais. Mais j'aime ça. Ah, oui, 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 oui. Si ça donne pour vous, vous aussi. Je vais vous Hey, Krusty. How about a beer? Well, I would like to wash up first. Ah, come on. Good, clean dirt you can wash later. A couple of beers, sweetheart. And a deck of cards. I looked for you last night. You were out. Was she pretty? No, you're wrong. I went to a lecture at the university. Missed the last bus. Had to walk back in the rain. It serves you right. Why? Enlightenment is a curse of civilization. A man who wastes his energy and knowledge is a fool. The more he learns, the more he wants, and the more unhappy he becomes. Tear down the schoolhouses, burn the books, strangle the teachers. Then the world will get somewhere. Ah, the beer. And the cards. To play for the drink. Why should a man who wants to develop his brain work in a coal mine? Answer me that. You could have gotten a soft job on the surface. I wanted to work below. Hiding out, are you? Police after you? No. A woman? No, I just thought it would do me good to work up a sweat. But have the other poles told you about me? Not much. They advised me not to play cards with you because you're cheap. Do you think it's true? Yes. I know it is. Then why do you play with me? For the fun of it. Ha! I've been watching you for days, and I can't see how it's done. You never will, my boy. But I shouldn't have thought it worth your while just for the price of a few drinks. I like to keep my hand in. What are you going to do when you get enough of this? Go back to America? I will, I suppose, one of these days. And do what? Sell bonds. <laughs> You're a rum one, Larry. But what about the answers to all those profound questions you have been asking yourself? Don't you know people have been asking the same questions for thousands of years? Yes, but doesn't the fact that people have been asking those same questions for thousands of years only go to prove that they can't help asking them? Very good. Very good. You're not altogether stupid. As a matter of fact, you sound like a very religious man who doesn't believe in God. I'm not sure that I believe in anything. Have you ever thought of going to the East? No. India, for instance? I went there. I met a strange man. A man I never thought to meet in this world. A saint. People go from all parts of India to see him. Tell him their troubles, ask his advice, and listen to his teaching. And they go away, strengthened in soul and at peace. But it's not his teaching that's so remarkable. It's the man himself. Did he help you? No. <laughs> But that wasn't his fault. It was mine. How did you ever come to go to India? To escape my pursuer. He followed me there. I have wallowed in the gutters of half the seaports of Europe. To put him off my track, he was waiting for me. <laughs> I know, however far I flee, one day he will come up with me and I shall feel the terrible hand on my shoulder. But wouldn't it be better to face the issue and take your punishment? But you don't know what the punishment is. It's not prison or the hangman's rope. I could face that. It's mercy, forgiveness, love. Didn't anybody ever tell you that I'm a unfrocked priest? It's not the police I'm running away from. I'd kill anyone who tried to arrest me. It's God. You fool, I'm going to get drunk.
करोगे बहुत अच्छा उसका बंदोबस्त कर दिया है Sorry, we were interrupted. They're pilgrims. They come from many places, some from quite far distances. What has brought you here, my son? I've come to learn. Ever since the war, I've been searching for something, something that I, I've, I've not been able to put into words. I've been told that from you, I might find. Guidance. God is the only guide. But perhaps if we talk, He may show me a way to help you. To my friends, I'm a loafer, afraid of responsibilities. I can't even make those I love understand what I'm after. The very fact that you've taken the time to come this great distance in search of knowledge proves that you're not afraid of responsibilities. Even to admit that you want to learn is in itself courageous. I've studied. I've traveled. I've read everything I could get my hands on, and nothing seems to satisfy me. Oh, like everyone else, I want to succeed. I want to improve, but not necessarily in the terms of what the world calls success. Somehow, I've lost confidence in the accepted values. I try to get excited at the prospect of settling down, minding my own business, and making good. But it only increases my urge to move on. I know that if I do find what I'm looking for, it will be something that I can share with others. But how to find it, and where? All your restlessness and confusion are not unique, my son. The whole world is restless and confused. It will always be so. As long as men set their ideals on the wrong objects, there can be no real happiness until men learn that it comes from within themselves. It is written that the wise man lives from within himself, which is from God, from within his own heart. This is the way of calmness, forbearance, compassion, selflessness, and everlasting peace. But that's not easy. No. The road to salvation is difficult to pass over. As difficult as the sharp edge of a razor, but there's much we know, and all religions teach it. There is in every one of us a spark of the infinite goodness which created us, and when we leave this earth, we are reunited with it, as a raindrop falling from heaven is at last reunited with the sea which gave it birth. Stay here with you. Of course you may. Our life's very simple. There are books. We will talk together. You can even work in the fields if you wish. We Indians believe there are three roads that lead to God. One is the path of faith and worship. One is the path of good works performed for the love of God. And then there is a third path. Which leads through knowledge to wisdom. You have chosen the way of knowledge, but you'll find in the end, my son, that the three paths are but one path. One of my students will show you where to sleep. Michigan 7182. 
Want to get Mr. Gray Matron. Is Dr. Thompson here? Yes, he is. We'll hold the hypo for now. She's doing all right. You'll want it, Doctor. I'm Gray Matron, Doctor. They sent for me. How is she? She's conscious now. She asked about her husband. Will you tell her? Tell her? Doesn't she know? No, she should be told before a possible shock reaction. You're an old friend. Hello, Gray. It was nice of you to come. I got here as quickly as I could. It's such a silly thing to happen. A bunch of drunks. They ran into us at an intersection. You might all have been killed. It was lucky I was holding the baby in my arms. Is the car badly damaged? Where's Bob? Uh, Careful of her arm. But where's Bob? I want Bob. Bob? You have to stay in bed, Mrs. McDonald. Take it easy, Sophie. No. I've got to see Bob and, and baby. Baby. Don't let her baby. get up. I'll get the doctor. Sophie, be a good girl and no, lie down. Leave me alone, you swine. Please, please, Sophie. Is Bob dead, Gray? Is he dead? You can tell me, Gray. Yes. Maybe two. Linda. Linda! Baby. Hypo. <laughs> Start on your pilgrimage? Yes. I'll miss it here. I've been very happy. We'll miss you too. But you've got all you can get from books. It's time for you now to put the world behind you for a while. To isolate yourself completely from everything. Sometimes very strange things happen when you're in the mountains. Not a living soul within miles of you. Nothing above you but the sky and God. What sort of things? That, my son, depends on you. You'll find a little shelter up there at the very top. Go in, make yourself at home. After you've been there some time, perhaps I shall pay you a visit.
signal the ketchup. Yes, I see. You were right. Something very strange did happen to them. I know. Tell me. It was just at that moment before night ends and day begins. When the whole world seems to tremble in the balance. Gradually the light began to filter through the darkness. Like some mysterious figure stealing through the trees. And then the first rays of the sun came up. The mountains. The mist caught in the treetops. I'd never before felt or seen anything like it. I know. I come here often. I felt that I'd been released from my body. That I was suspended in midair. That all the things that had been confused before suddenly became clear to me. I had a sense of knowledge more than human. I felt that I'd broken away and was free. I felt that if it lasted another minute, I... And yet I was willing to die if I could just hold on to it, because for that one moment, I had the feeling that you and God were one. Yes. I'm sure I could stay here forever and never tire of it. No. You must go back. You are now ready to go back. That's not necessary to leave the world, my son, but rather to live in the world and to love the objects of the world, not for themselves alone, but for what there is in them of God. Your place is with your own people. You, my son, are one of the fortunate ones. By the grace of God, it's been given you to see the infinite beauty of the world which is only the reflection seen through a glass duct of the beauty of God. That sense of joy, that vision of his beauty will remain with you fresh and vivid till the day of your death. Monsieur Duquette. Oui, monsieur. Venez, venez. Uh, this quest is not in the proper place at all. The quest belongs up here, up here. I'm not running in the Olympic Games, you know. It'll all have to be done over immediately. Now, about this robe. It's really dreadful, dreadful. And look at this tassel. Hideous. It should strike me here at the knees, lower, lower, so that when I walk, it'll sway. As it is now, it just bubbles. Where are my ties? Uh, les cravates de monsieur, tout de suite. It isn't. By Jove, it is. Oh. <laughs> my dear fellow. Elliot. Wherever have you been all these years? I've been a lot in the Orient. The last time I passed through Paris, you were away. Uh, come in, come in. I have a house on the Riviera now. I reach the time of life when I'm prepared to relax and enjoy the beauties of nature. 
You surprise me, Edith. You've always looked on nature as an impediment to social intercourse. Paris is not what it was. There's practically nobody to know here anymore. Uh, but on the Riviera, there's some really quite nice people. In fact, the shores of the Mediterranean are simply littered with royalties. Heavens knows I'm not a snob. Uh, but uh, just as a matter of interest, I don't mind telling you that on one occasion, I had two ex-kings to lunch. <laughs> two. How oh, nice. Elliot, what the devil's that crown doing over your initials? His Holiness has been graciously pleased to revive in my favor my old family title. Your what? Oh, didn't you know? I'm descended in the female line from the Count de Loria, who came over to England with Philip II and married a maid of honor to Queen Mary. As an American citizen, I feel it more modest not to use my title except on all my personal linen. I think that's a very pretty gesture on your part, Elliot. Je I don't mind telling you I take a modest pride in concealing my rank under the sober pinstripe of an American gentleman. You know that Isabel, the great matron, I hear, with her two children. Oh, there I didn't know. I've only just arrived in Paris. They were wiped out in the crash. Ah, yes, I heard that. Poor Isabel even had a sell her jewels. The Gray tried to get a job, but it appears there was no business. The result was a nervous breakdown, and he suffers from the most frightful headaches. He couldn't take a job now, even if he could get one. Oh, I am so sorry. I couldn't allow them to live like pigs, Isabel without a maid and no governess for the children. So I've lived in my apartment here until Gray can get back to his feet again. You're the most generous creature in the world, Elliot. Ellie, Chef D. Nonsense. If I'm taking care of them, it's because, well, Noblesse oblige, you know. Can I drop him somewhere? What about coming and having a spot of lunch with me? I'm expecting an old friend of yours. I was not aware that I had any old friends in Paris. And even if I have, I assure you, nothing would give me less pleasure than to meet them at this time of day. Come along, jump in. We're meeting at the dome. I just like being hustled. To the dome. And what about you? Were you hurt in the crash? God tempers the wind to the shorn lamb. Uh, I happened to be in Rome in September 29. My friends strongly advised me to sell my American securities. I very sensibly took their advice. So when the crash came, it was sitting pretty. An Americanism, my dear fellow, which I see no occasion for you to use. But uh, it expresses my situation with a good deal of accuracy. In fact, I was inspired to sell short and made what you would probably call a killing. <laughs> You're a downy old bird, Elliot. I have a flair. I do not like the propinquity of the hoi polloi. Oh, Larry. Hello. Larry, I thought you were dead. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. I'm delighted to see you, Larry. Where have you sprung from? India. India. I believe you're in town. Oui, monsieur. Where is you? If you gentlemen will excuse me, I will now leave you. I find I have an engagement. Goodbye, my dear fellow. Goodbye. 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 <laughs> Do you know Isabel and Gray are here? Really? Where are they staying? In Elliot's apartment. Their children are with them. Oh, I must look them up. If you don't want to scare them out of their wits and drive their two little girls into hysterics, you'd better get a haircut. Well, that'd be a good idea anyway. They've had rather a bad time. The maturing company was wiped out in the crash. Gray had a nervous breakdown. Poor Gray. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. What did you do in India? I learned something about myself. I was very happy there. Mr. Morrison. Yes, I know. Hello, Mr. Hello. Morrison. Good to see you again. Isabel, tell me she talked with you on the telephone. Would you tell Mrs. Matcher and Mr. Morrison here? Yes, sir. I'm very sorry to hear you've been under the weather, Gray. Oh, it's just one of those things that comes and goes. I can't seem to get rid of it. I thought perhaps if I came over here for a few months, the change might do me good. Hello! Mr. Morrison. Isabel, this is a pleasure. How are the children? Oh, wonderful. Growing by leaps and bounds. How's it, Nanny? Oh, I'm all right. 
If you'll excuse me, I always feel such a nuisance when I'm like this. Do you want anything, Gail? No. Sure? Mm-hmm. Poor boy. What a pity. I was hoping you and Gray would dine with me tonight. Oh, I'd love to. But he really suffers. You look very well, Mr. Mom. I am very well. Larry hasn't arrived yet. Larry? Yes, he lunched with me today. He said he would drop in on you this afternoon. Larry in Paris? Where has he been? India. But I didn't know. I didn't know he'd been in India. Do you realize I haven't laid eyes on him for, for years? Did you tell him we'd lost all our money? Mm-hmm. It's funny when you come to think of it, that we should have almost exactly the income that Larry had when he wanted me to marry him. And I wouldn't because we couldn't possibly live on it. And now I have two children besides. I don't think you're so terribly to be pitied. Mes enfants, Elsa Gassler, Père, quand il a mal à la tête. Excuse me. Voyons, Betty, je vous en prie, votre pauvre père encore mal à la tête. Mais bien, il fait plus de bruit, hein? Il est tellement baisé. Tu veux pas? Mr. Darrell. Oui, monsieur. Isabel. Isabel. Larry. Oh, Larry, I can't believe it. Where did they go? Who? Oh, the brood. Come on, babies. Come on, darling. Come back. Oh, come here. <laughs> What's your name? Joan. Joan. And how old are you? Seven. Seven. This is Priscilla. It has been a long time. Yes, a long time. It's a lovely brood. Where's Gray? In the library. Run along, darling. Hello, Larry. Hello. Come in and see Gray. Gray, look who's here. Gray, don't get up. Larry, I am glad to see you. Sorry you caught me like this. Blinding headache. Yes. Mr. Mom wants to take us all out this evening. Yes, I thought we'd dine and do the town. Do you feel up to it? Well, that's very nice of you, Mr. Mom, but I'm afraid not. Larry will go, won't you, Larry? Oh, poor Gray. Oh, now you sail on, all of you. Don't let me spoil your evening. No, wait a minute. Would you let me see if I can help you? How? I mean, I, uh... I might be able to help you help yourself. All right. Here. Sit down. What are you going to do? Wait. What's this? It's an old coin from India. Here. Close your fingers tightly on this. Palm downward. Now, don't fight me. Don't make any effort. Just squeeze the coin with your closed fist. Before I count ten, your hand will open and the coin will drop out of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I didn't let that coin drop. It fell out of itself. It's not important. I just thought it might give you confidence in me. Why? You'll see. Here. Got it? Mm hmm Excuse me. Here. What do you want me to do? Well, come back in the corner and sit right against those cushions. Get comfortable. Are you comfortable? I think so. Have you got a watch? 
palm downward. Thank you. 643. In 60 seconds, your eyelids will grow heavy. So heavy that you will be obliged to close them. Then you will sleep for another minute. At 6.45, you will wake up and you will have no more pain. No more pain. in India. There's nothing miraculous about it. I merely put an idea into his head. He's doing the rest himself. I did doze off. Is your head better? I don't know. Could be. You did something. What did you do? I didn't do it. You did it yourself. Did I? Of course. That's a new one. A moment ago, my head was splitting wide open from here to here. How is it now? Well, it's certainly better. Do you think you could cure him permanently? Well, I can't work miracles, but there's no reason why he couldn't cure himself in time. But that was a miracle. I saw it. Well, whatever it was, it sure helped. Enough to come along to dinner with us. Sure, I'd like to come to dinner. I haven't eaten a thing all day. You're coming, Larry. I'd love to. You know, I haven't danced with you for years, Isabel. I'd like to find out if I still know how. We'll see. I'll go get my things. Oh, uh, would you like a drink, Mr. Mom, Larry? Everything's here. Oh, hello. How's your friend, Elliot Templeton? Pretty well, I think. <laughs> Who was that? The Princess Nova Mali. Oh. Edna. Funny fellow, that Larry. He doesn't look a day older than he did when he left Chicago all those years ago. India changed him changed him. He looks extraordinarily happy to me. Calm, yet strangely aloof. Excuse me, do you have a match? Oh, yes. Did you get the car? Not yet. Thanks. Does he dance as well as ever? I didn't notice. You're not going to be so silly as to fall in love with him again, are you? I've never stopped loving him. I've never loved anyone else in my life. Marriage is a pretty difficult job, even when one's in love. I shouldn't have thought it much fun when one is not. One can get on all right without that. Gray is such a good fellow. Be a pity to hurt him. I'll never do anything to hurt him. I'm too fond of him for that. Well, it's your business, not mine. Well, to now, how about uh, Les Ambassadeurs? Oh, no, I'm sick of all these smart places. Well? How about the Rue de Lap? I've never been there. At least it will be different. The Rue de Lap and those clothes? Oh, nonsense. I can keep my jacket on. Oh, please, it'll be fun. Okay. Don't blame us if you don't like it. You better pull down the blinds if you don't want a bottle through the window in that district. Who kind of say La Rue de Lap? Oui, monsieur. I'm 
not scared I like. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> the police will probably choose this very moment to raise the place. I should be filled with the marrow. Hey, on a des Américains ici. En noir, toutes les Américaines sont brusquées comme ça. Any champagne in Paris is all right, isn't it? Well, I don't... Look who's here. Sophie. Who'd you think it was? Sit down. Sit down, all of you. Hello, Grace. Sit down. I'll get your chair, Sophie. Vincent! Voilà. Une chaise. Voilà, toi même, Phineas. Fancy meeting you all like this. Hello, Larry. Hi, brown eyes. How are you? Thirsty. Come on, let's all have a drink. Patron! Merci, Monsieur Dame, Sophie. Do I know them? They're my childhood friends. Donnez nous une bouteille de champagne. Et encore sous la main pour Sophie. Ta gueule says I'm drunk. I know you. You came to Chicago. Bit of a stuffed chair, don't you? Maybe. I can't say you seem so terribly pleased to see me. I heard you were in Paris, Sophie. You might have called me. I'm in the phone book. Oh, yes. Having a good time over here, Sophie? Fine. You went bust, didn't you, Grace? Tough on you. I guess it must be pretty grim in Chicago right now. Lucky for me, I got out when I did. Where are those drinks? I'm in the I flung the cool Here they are, sir. My loving in-laws kicked me out of Chicago. Said I was gumming up their reputation. Et alors, Sophie, tu viens, on va en danser une. Oh, la paix, tu vois donc pas que je suis avec des amis. Tes copains, je m'en fous, moi. Allez, viens, on danse. Look out, Coco. He's the quiet type. He'll lay you out cold. Shut up, là. <laughs> Is that a friend of yours, Sophie? Yes, that's a friend of mine, Isabel. Are you living in Paris now, Larry? Yes, I am, Sophie. You remember the summer before the war? Sure. We saw a lot of each other then. When? You and your mother being social. We used to read poetry together. Remember, Larry? You used to write some poetry yourself in those days. Pretty good, too, wasn't it? Not bad. For a kid. It was good. Well, I better get back to my boyfriend. Or he'll raise the roof. He's a sulky brute, but quite a man. Come and see me. When you're nothing better to do. I've got a case of scotch.
So long, folks. Come again. I'm here every night. That was not a great success. Some shocked to see Sophie. Boy, was she tight. If not worse. That's funny. I got the same impression. Do you remember her at all? Very well. I liked her. I remember her husband. You never saw two people so crazy about each other. They got to be a regular joke around Chicago. But what happened? Didn't you know? Bob and the baby were killed. A car hit them. So that's what it is. She nearly went crazy. We did all we could to help her, but it was no good. If you asked her to dinner, she'd come in plastered and pass out before the evening was over. At last, we simply had to drop her. She became impossible. Of course, it was a shock, and I was terribly sorry for her. But a normal person recovers. If she went to pieces, it was because she was always unbalanced. Even her love for Bob was exaggerated. Aren't I right, Larry? No, I don't agree with you, Isabel. She was as normal as any person I've ever known. But remember, I knew her better than you did. Was she in love with you? Good heavens, no. She was only a kid. Just a skinny little girl with a bow in her hair. I remember her crying once when... when I was reading an ode of Keats. Because it was so beautiful. Girls of that age are very emotional. Oh, there was a lot to her in those days. She had what Keats probably would have called a, a sort of lovely purity. Chauffeur, would you stop at the next corner? I want to get out, please. Hey, Larry, you're not going to run out of it, sorry. Oh, well, my hotel's only a step from here. Oh. Good night. Larry, will we see you? Of course. We're going to Vitel on Thursday with Uncle Elliot. He wants to take the cure. We'll be back by the first of the month. I'll call you. Fine. Oh, good night. Good night, Gray. Good night, Larry. Good night, Larry. And thanks for the dinner. Excusez-moi, mademoiselle, je ne savais pas que c'était vous. Euh, non, monsieur, euh, Darren n'est pas encore entré. Non. Un message pour lui euh... Oh, attendez, mademoiselle. Il arrive maintenant. Attendez. Monsieur Darren, téléphone. Oh, merci. Hello? Larry. At last. I've been trying to reach you for hours. Aren't you ever in? Uh, hardly ever. When did you get back? This morning. Uncle Elliot insisted on being here in time for Elsa's soiree tonight. Poor dear, he's not at all well. But he will go to all these parties. How's Gray getting along? Oh, Larry, you've simply done wonders for him. He started to play golf again. He blames it all on you. And what have you been doing? Oh, one thing and another. I've seen a lot of Sophie. Really? Why? Well, after all, she's an old friend. If you want my opinion, I think you're wasting your time. She stopped drinking. Oh, Larry, you're the most gullible person I've ever known. She'll never stop drinking. Sophie wallows in the gutter because she likes it. A blind person could see that. Well, just the same, I do wish you'd be nice to her, Isabel. We're going to be married. What? Married? Yes, that's right. It's all settled. You're not serious. You can't be. But 
but I am. Well, aren't you going to congratulate me? I am not. I think you're... What's kept you? You've been hours. I came the instant I got your call. What's happened? It's about Larry and Sophie. The idiot. The stupid, blind idiot. He must be mad. If you'd calm down for a moment, I might be able to make head or tail of what you're trying to say. He's going to marry her. Oh. Oh. How do you know? How should I know? He just called me on the phone. Oh, I'm frantic. So I see. He even had the effrontery to ask me to be nice to her. Well, it's his own affair, isn't it? She's an awful woman. Bad, bad, bad. She sows from morning till night. That doesn't necessarily mean she's bad. Quite a number of respectable citizens get drunk and do silly things. They're bad habits like biting one's nails, but I don't know if they're worse than that. I call a person bad who lies and cheats and is unkind. If you're going to take her part, I'll kill you. I prefer if you give me a cup of tea. Oh, help yourself. He's seen a lot of her since we were at that dive that night. He says she's quit drinking. The fool thinks he's cured her. Have you forgotten what he did for Gray? That had nothing to do with it. Thanks. Gray wanted to be cured. She doesn't. How do you know? Because I know women. Do you think she'll stick to Larry? Of course not. Sooner or later, she'll break out. It's in her blood. It's a brute she wants. That's what excites her. It's a brute she'll go after. She'll lead Larry to hell. It's very probable, but I don't see what you can do about it. I can do nothing about it. But you can. I? Larry likes you, and he listens to what you say. You know the world. Go to him and tell him he can't make such a fool of himself. Tell him it'll ruin him. He'd only tell me it's none of my business, and he'd be quite right. It may not turn out so badly as you think. Oh, you make me tired. She's rotten to the core. Do you think I've sacrificed myself only to let Larry fall into the hands of a woman like that? How did you sacrifice yourself? I gave up Larry for one reason only. Because I didn't want to stand in his way. <laughs> oh, come off it, Isabel. You gave him up for a square-cut diamond and a sable coat. Oh! <laughs> oh. You know, your, your Uncle Elliot wouldn't have thanked you if you'd broken one of his Crown Derby plates. They were made for the Duchess of Dorset, and they're priceless. Pick up that bread and butter. Pick it up yourself. And you call yourself an English gentleman. No, that's one thing I've never done. Oh, get out of here. I never want to see you again. I hate the sight of you. I'm sorry for that, because the sight of you always gives me pleasure. Have you ever been told that your nose is exactly like that of the Psyche in the Museum of Naples? And that's the loveliest representation of virginal beauty that ever existed. You've got exquisite legs, so long and shapely. I can't cease to be surprised at them, because they were thick and lumpy when I first saw you. I can't imagine how you've managed it. An iron will. But of course, your most fascinating feature are your hands. They're so slim and elegant. I was under the impression you thought them too big. Not for your height and build. I'm always amazed at the infinite grace with which you use them. Huh? Whether by nature or by art, you never make a gesture without imparting beauty to it. They're like flowers sometimes, and sometimes like birds on the wing. There are moments when I don't positively dislike you. <laughs> In fact, sometimes I think you're rather sweet. I will not have my face smeared with lipstick. If you want to kiss me, kiss me on the lips, which is what a merciful providence provided them for. Thank you. Now, what's it you want? Advice. There's only one thing you can do. Make the best of a bad job. Larry's in the grip of the most powerful emotion that can beset the breast of man. Self-sacrifice. He's got to save the soul of the wretched woman whom he had known as an innocent child. And there's nothing you or I or anyone can do to prevent it. But he's going to be so unhappy. 
You love him very much? It is a nuisance, isn't it? But I can't help it. And you don't want to lose him altogether? Then make friends with Sophie. Be as nice to her as you can. Ask her to lunch. It would be rather awkward for me after what I've just said to Larry. Will you behave if I do? Like an angel of light. I'll fix it up. One o'clock tomorrow at the Ritz. What are you thinking? I don't quite like the look of you. I'm sorry. I thought that was the one thing about me you did like. You haven't got some scheme you've been hatching up. Oh, I promise you I haven't. As a matter of fact, I'm terribly curious to see what she looks like, now that Larry's reformed her. Oh, there you are. Excuse me. Mr. Malm's table? In the lounge, monsieur. Thank you. Larry, you like it? You look fine. Come on. Hello, Larry. Well, Miss Keith. How do you do? It's certainly nice to see you. Yes. Hello, Sophie. Oh, hello, Isabel. Sophie, I'm so happy for you. Thank you. Hello, Larry. Hello. Here they are. Thank you for asking us. Hello, Gray. Hello, Larry. Isabel tells me you're feeling much better. Better is not the word for it. I feel great. I haven't had to take a sleeping pill since the night we went out together. I'm your press agent. If you ever hang out your shingle, let me know. I'll do that. Oh, a cocktail. No, thank you. Here. No, thanks. You don't mind if we do? Oh, no, of course not. Go right ahead. Oh, look. <laughs> Uncle Elliot. He behaves exactly as if the Ritz were his private house. I'm sure he's telling them all how pleased he is they were able to accept his invitation. <laughs> I'd rather not discuss it. Allons déjeuner. Isabel? That bloody woman. Uh, how do you do? It's charming to see you again. May I offer you my best wishes? I hope you'll be very happy. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you. Cocktail, Elliot? No, I would not like a cocktail. I'd drink nothing but Vichy. <laughs> Look at that. You all know her, of course, the Princess Edna Novimale. You never think she was an American, but I knew her before she came over here from Milwaukee. And that frustrated old maid secretary of hers. If you ask me, they look like a couple of fugitives from Madame Tussauds' waxworks. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, where will you and Larry go on your honeymoon, my dear? Greece, isn't it? Greece. It ought to be lovely there this time of year. Lovely. How about a liqueur, Gray? Yes, I think I will. Ah, yes, this. <clears throat> Sophie? No, thanks. You're very foolish, my dear. It's excellent. No, Uncle Elliot. She doesn't want it. Gray? A little Thank glass you. for Monsieur. Uh, uh, bonjour, Albert. No, alas, it's forbidden me. My doctors won't let me touch alcohol. A tear of Perzovka can do monsieur no harm. Perzovka? Perzovka. I'll just have a look at the bottle. I'm sorry to hear you've been ill, Elliot. You ought to take care of yourself. Ah, uh, Perzovka. Hmm. <laughs> it can't hurt me for once. Just a drop. Hmm. Two drops, perhaps. We used to drink it at the Radzivills when I stayed with them for the shooting. <laughs> you should have seen those Polish princes putting it away. <laughs> they drink it with a tumbler and never turn a hair. I don't care whether Sophie's on the wagon or not, she must try this. It's an experience no one can miss. It's like listening to music by moonlight. I'd rather not. Isabel? I smell. Mm. That's the herbs they put in it. Oh, very good. Can we have some of this at the apartment? Well, certainly. I'll have a few bottles sent around. What did you say it was like, Uncle Elliot? Like listening to music by moonlight. It is. Selfie. Yes? I saw the most divine wedding dress at Molyneux. Let me give it to you for a wedding present. Uncle Elliot and me. What? That's very nice of you, Isabel, but Sophie has one already picked up. Oh, don't be stuffy, Larry. Let us give her a dress. I'll call Molyneux and arrange a fitting. May she? 
Certainly, it's very nice of you. Thank you very much, both of you. Not at all, not at all. Suppose you pick me up tomorrow at three at the apartment. Larry, you know the address, don't you? Yes, I know the address. Oh, good heavens, we don't want you. You're only the groom. <laughs> I'll see you at three. Yes, it was a lovely party. No, of course I did. I behaved like an angel. I always do. Oh, how silly. Stop imagining things. I meant every word of it. Yes. Yes. Tomorrow. At five. That was Somerset Maugham on the telephone. He always gives me the queerest feeling. As if he were leading other people's lives for them. But I dare say that comes of being a novelist. Here. Oh. Thanks. Mr. Maugham. <laughs> I called him a stuffed shirt that night, didn't I? What does it matter? That's all past. You weren't yourself. Your mind was miles away when I came in. Where was it? With Larry? No, right here, I was thinking. What? You always wanted Larry for yourself. I've always wanted to see him happy. You hate me for marrying him, don't you? No. I don't hate you at all. I'd hate anyone or anything that came in the way of his happiness. I'll be a good wife. I hope you will. I was before. I know you were. Sophie, don't misunderstand me. I don't. What are we getting into? Coffee? Ice? No, thanks. I'm going to have a drink. Oh, look. Uncle Elliot sent the Perzovka. The what? Don't you remember? He raved about it yesterday. Oh, yes, the Prazovka. Poor Uncle Elliot. He exaggerates about so many things, but for once he's right. I love the color. Like the green you sometimes see in the heart of a white rose. Poor Sophie. I haven't had a drink since that night in the Rue de Lap. It must be awful. Just to break off completely, all at once. Sometimes when I've been alone, I wanted to shake the house down. But I quit. Yesterday at the Ritz was tough going. I know, I saw it. Did you? Did I show it? Only to me, I think. It meant something to me. Larry, you mean. Larry's happiness. He's good. He's really good, Isabel. I was gone. Lost. Gone. This is my only chance, I know that. Excuse me. Is the car here? Yes, ma'am. Could we talk more? Of course, as much as you want. Will you wait for me? I've got to pick up Joan at the dentist. I promised I would. Your baby. How old is she now? Seven. Here. She's lovely. Linda would have been nine in November. This November that's coming. Stay here. I'll be back and we can talk.
va sa fille, elle a loupé du bon fric américain, hein? Sa fille, mais elle appartient à Stutley, qui radine tous de Chicago. Il était un kikiner. Alors, t'as trouvé ce que tu cherchais? C'est la ferme, quoi, ça c'est pas tes oignons. Sophie McDonald, the American. Tell her I'll be back later. You pourrais pas parler français? Ah oui. Si vous voyez Sophie McDonald, l'américain, dites-lui que je reviendrai plus tard. C'est bon, on lui dira. Qu'est-ce que tu fais? Ferme la porte des ballons! Il y a le risque qui rapide. Personne ne peut pas Hi, big boy. Please, pass me some personne ne Persovska, mon chéri, est-ce qu'ils boivent cela en Algérie Pardon, monsieur. Où est cette dame à demander un Persovska Américaine ou une argilée Où est ça Où est-ce Je ne te conseille pas de te montrer là-bas. Voulez-vous gagner 100 francs À votre service, monsieur. I speak de English from London. Allez voir, comment on Par ici, monseigneur. Par ici. Mais pourquoi j'ai trouvé un pigeon Better I do not go in, monsieur. I will wait for you there. Sophie. Let's get out of here. Hello, Larry. Come on, join us. Pezovka. You must try some. It smells nice. I like listening to music by moonlight. Come along, Sophie. Up you go. Up. Are you interested? Je 
That was the very last I saw or heard of Sophie MacDonald for almost a year. As a matter of record, it's the very last any of us knew of her. I settled down at my cottage on the Riviera near Cap Ferrat to finish my book. And then one day, the police of Toulon sent for me. Monsieur Mom. Bonjour, Monsieur le Commissaire. Good morning, Monsieur Mom. I see Monsieur Mom wears the Légion d'honneur. I have that distinction. I must apologize for being obliged to inconvenience a person of your distinction. Well, I'm sure nothing would make me happier than being in service to you. Now, about this. Yes. This is a very dirty business, monsieur. It appears that the woman, Sophie MacDonald, had a very evil reputation. She was brutally murdered. What? Her body was fished out of the arbor. The throat was cut from ear to ear. Dreadful. N'est-ce pas? C'est épouvantable. Alors, je ne comprends pas, monsieur. How does it happen? That a person of your age. And respectability should be acquainted with such a character. I knew her very slightly. This volume was found in her room. If you will examine the autograph page, you will see it hardly suggest that your acquaintance with her was as slight as you claim. Mignon, allons voir si la rose. Mignon. My sweet, let us see if the rose. If you're suggesting I was her lover, you're mistaken. It would be no affair of mine. And without wishing to say anything offensive to you, I must add that, from what I've heard of her proclivities, I should say that you were not her type. I'm prepared to take that as a compliment. Nevertheless, it is evident that you will not address a perfect stranger as my sweet. That line, Monsieur le Commissaire, is the first of a celebrated poem by Ronsard, with whose works I am certain a man of your education and culture must be familiar. Ronsard. Ronsard. Oh, Ronsard! Evidently, tout le monde connaît Ronsard. Of course, I studied Ronsard at school, but with all the work I have to do, I must confess that line has escaped my memory. As a matter of fact, I signed this book for her years ago in Chicago. Hello, Mr. Mom. Why, Larry, I didn't know you were here. I thought you were living in San Ari. Yeah, they sent for me. Have they told you? No, it's dreadful. I've just seen her at the morgue. I had to identify her for the police. Pardon, Monsieur Mom. You know this individual? I do. He's an American citizen. His name is Lawrence Darrow. And what do you know of Monsieur Laurence Dorel? He's a student, a young man of impeccable character. Ah, impeccable, eh? And how long have you known this young man of impeccable character? Approximately ten years. Huh? Have any arrangements been made to bury her? Well, if you are prepared to undertake the expense of the funeral yourself, you will receive the necessary authorization. Pardon, monsieur. I have here a card of an undertaker, a personal friend of mine, who will arrange the matter for you on terms and with dispatch. You are a marvel of efficiency, Monsieur le Commissaire. You flatter me beaucoup, Monsieur Mom. May I see where she lived? You have not seen that room before? No, I have not. Well, en ce cas, Monsieur, suivez-moi. Alors, nous allons à la maison du crime, n'est-ce pas? Par ici, Monsieur.
I have a card here of one of the best restaurants in Toulon. It will assure you of the patron's attention. A bottle of wine will do you both good after this harrowing experience. I've got to get on to Nice this afternoon. Elliot Temperton's had a relapse. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. The Gray and Isabel now? Yes, I only hope they'll arrive in time. I wish you'd come with me. I'd like to, of course, but I was never one of Uncle Elliot's favorites, if you remember. How is he? Very weak, sir. The doctors say there's no hope. May I speak to you on a very delicate matter, sir? Of course. The time is going short, and Mr. Templeton should receive the last sacraments. I hesitate to mention it to him. Sir, but perhaps... I should be glad to suggest it. Thank you, sir. La cloche dans le ciel qu'on voit doucement teinte. Un oiseau sur l'arbre qu'on voit chante sa plainte. I hear voices. See who it is. Entrez. It's the moment, Mr. Dell. Ah, oh, my dear fellow, how very nice to see you. And Larry. Well, this, this is a surprise. Uh, sit down, yeah. sit down. Mr. Morm said you were sick. Did he? Well, I am sick. But you don't look it. You look extremely well. Well... Really now, young Mr. Larry Darrell, that's the most sensible thing I've ever heard you say. Of course he's right. It's only a temporary indisposition. I've got the Grand Duke lunch with me on Sunday, and I've told my doctor he must put me to rights by then at all costs. Too bad this should have happened just now. It's a particularly brilliant season. Are you going to Edna Nobimale's party? Of course not. Has she asked you? She's asked everybody in Europe. She's giving a great do. Fancy dress. Hmm? Fancy dress. She hasn't asked me. It's a deliberate insult. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Why should she want to insult you? It's just an oversight. I'm not a man that people overlook. But perhaps she doesn't know you're in the south of France. Don't be ridiculous, Larry. Everybody knows I'm in the south of France. It's going to be the best party of the season. If I was on my deathbed, I'd go to it. Never mind, old boy. It may rain the night of the party. That'll ruin it. <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> I'll pray for rain as I've never prayed before. <laughs> the old witch. She'd never have got anywhere if it hadn't been for me. Now, she doesn't invite me to the greatest party of her career. Fireworks, my dear fellow. They're going to be fireworks. So oh, God. I hate them. I hate them all. They've eaten my food and drunk my wine. I've run their errands for them. I've made their parties for them. What have I got out of it? Nothing. Now that I'm old and sick, they have no use for me. Care whether I live or die. Not one of them. Oh, it's so cruel. I wish I'd never left America. <laughs> I'm afraid you're very ill, Elliot. Much ill than you think. I was wondering if you'd like to see a priest. Do you mean to say I'm going to die? Oh, I hope not, but it's as well to be on the safe side. I understand. Don't be upset, my dear fellow. Noblesse oblige, you know. You, you ridiculous creature, Elliot. Will you call the bishop and tell him I'd appreciate if he'd send Father Charles? He's a friend of mine. I'll go and do that now. Well, may I borrow your car for a few moments? Of course. I thought I'd run over to Princess Novamali's house. 
Her secretary is an old Scotch girl that I've known for years, and I think I can do something about that invitation. She's a spiteful woman, Edna. There'll be a thousand people at her party. It couldn't have hurt her at least to ask Elliot. Leave that to me. Don't worry about the bags, darling. Well, you are, darling. Mr. Marble. Larry. Hello. This is a surprise. I had no idea you were here. Hello, Gray. Hello, How Larry. Is he? I'm afraid you've come only just in time. Oh, poor Uncle Elliot. I think he'd like to see you. Come on. Sorry, you're not leaving. I'll be right back. It's more usual to come in by the door, Larry. Hello, I thought the room was empty. Then may I inquire what you're doing here? I'm a burglar, dear. Fancy that now. And I thought for one happy moment that you'd come here to attack me. <laughs> no, Miss Keith. No, I came to steal a card for the princess's party. She hasn't asked Elliot Templeton. I know she hasn't. She crossed his name off on the list herself. He's awfully hurt at being left out. Well, if he wanted to keep in with her, he shouldn't have said those terrible things about her and her chauffeur. <laughs> the unfortunate part about it is that they're all true. <laughs> well, you have nothing against him, have you? Oh, no, no. He's always been very nice to me. He's a gentleman. And that's more than you can say about most of the people who come here to fill their fat bellies at the princess's expense. Oh, come, Miss Keith, be a good sport. Give me a card. He won't come. He's dying, and it'll make the poor old man so happy. The cards are on the desk. I am going to look out of the window to observe the beauty of the prospect. And what happens when my back is turned? Neither God nor man can hold me responsible for. By yon bonny banks and by yon bonny braes, where the sun shines bright on Loch Lomond, where me and my true love were ever Thank you, Miss Keith. To on the bonny, bonny banks of Loch Lomond. Our poor friend is very low. He was a good man. His defects were on the surface, but he was generous of heart and kindly toward his fellow creatures. You may go in now. Okay. A great honor, my dears. I shall enter the kingdom of heaven with a letter of introduction from a prince of the church. I fancy all doors will be open to me. I'm afraid you'll find the company very mixed. Don't you believe it? There'll be none of this confounded democracy there. I shall pick and choose my company as I always have. No, no, no. Please don't draw the curtains. I always love this time of afternoon. Why don't you have a drink, my dear fellow? You always have a drink this time of day. I have had a drink, really. Have you? Isabel? You're going to make a scene, you will have to leave the room. I'm a rich man in my way, and I've left you everything I have. Oh, Uncle Ellie. No, 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 Gray, come here. I understand you have a job in prospect. Yes, a roommate of mine in college has offered me a job in his business. My idea is to go back and see if I can raise enough money to start up my father's firm again. It's still in receiver's hands. Splendid. Uh, you have the money now. My boy. Letter for Mr. Templeton, sir. It's marked urgent. Good. You better stay. Elliot. What is it? For you. Open it. What is it? The card for Edna Novabali's party. Yeah, what did I tell you? Get a pad and envelope. I'll reply. Oh, no, please, don't bother about that now, Uncle Why not? I've always been a man of 
the world. There's no reason why I should forget my manners as I'm leaving it. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Mr. Elliot Templeton regrets. He cannot accept Princess Novi Malley's kind invitation. Owing to a previous engagement with his blessed lord. The old witch. That's right. And what are you going to do? I thought I might take a job in a factory or a garage. I've always liked machinery, and besides, when I'm washing a car or tinkering with a carburetor, my mind's free, and at the same time, I feel I'm accomplishing something. And after that? I don't know. I, uh, I might buy a taxi. A taxi? Why not? It's a good life. You're always on the go. You meet a lot of different people. Oh, Larry, for heaven's sake. What you need is a good psychiatrist. Sometimes I think you're completely out of your mind. Just look what you've done with your life. And with mine. What in heaven's name are you trying to prove? I'd hope you'd come back to the States with us. Gray's going into business again, and he'll need all the help he can get. Larry, you've no idea what you've done for him. He spoke of it again, only yesterday. You can't see the change, but I can. When you're around, he's different. Much like his old self. Gray's all right. He doesn't need me. But suppose he does. Suppose something goes wrong again and he has another breakdown. You can't imagine what he went through the last time. It wasn't just a matter of headaches or nerves. He was sick, really sick. Larry, I've never told this to anyone before. But for months and months, we had to watch him every minute. It wasn't just losing his money and the business his father had built up. It was more than that. He blamed himself for all the things that happened to those little people who trusted him with their savings. I honestly believe that if it hadn't been for the children, he'd have killed himself. Well, there's nothing so surprising about that, Isabel. I don't suppose there's a man or woman living today who hasn't felt that way at least once in their lives. The wonderful thing about life is that most of us get a second chance. I got a second chance. Right at the moment when I thought there was nothing in the world worthwhile living for. Do you know what it means to see another man give up his life for you? Do you? Have you ever thought what it is to walk the streets at night knowing that you're walking in another man's shoes? That someone deliberately died so that you might go on living? Do you remember that night in Chicago when we talked at the country club? I told you then that I didn't think I'd ever find myself. Well, I haven't yet, completely. I found some of the things that I was looking for, 
and someday I may find them all. But in any event, I'm going to keep right on looking. It isn't easy and it isn't fun. I've known moments of futility and frustration. I've... But that's all past now. Past and done. I know what lies ahead. I know where I'm going. And Gray, in his own way, can do the same thing because this is his second chance. And I know he'll come through. All right. Suppose he does. And what about me? Doesn't it mean anything to you that I love you? That I've never loved anybody else but you? That my children might have been your children? That... Oh, why didn't I marry you when I had the chance? I could have. You know I could have. That last night in Paris, you were ready enough to give up all this foolishness for me. If I just had brains enough, I could have saved you. But no, I threw you out. I thought I was being so noble, remember? Look at me, Larry. You know you love me. You know that you've always wanted me. Say it's true. Say you know it's true. Oh, Larry. I love you. I love you. Promise you'll come back with us. Promise you will. Tell me about Sophie, Isabel. Sophie? What about Sophie? That afternoon she came to your apartment. Did she have anything to drink? Yes. Herzovka? How did you know? Isn't it strange that she should have asked for such an unfamiliar liqueur? She didn't ask for anything. She just helped herself. I had to leave to pick up my daughter at the dentist's. And when I returned, Sophie was gone and the bottle was empty. But when you found Sophie gone and the bottle empty, Weren't you surprised? I thought she got tired of waiting. When I noticed the bottle was empty, I thought the butler had drunk it. I very nearly spoke to him about it. You never were a very good liar, Isabel. You don't believe me. Not for a moment. Then don't. All right, if you want the truth, you can have it. I did it, and I'd do it again. I was determined to stop at nothing to prevent her marrying you. Nobody else would do a thing. They didn't care. I did. Oh, Larry, you men are such fools. I knew that sooner or later she'd break down and stuck out a mile. You saw how jittery she was at the Ritz. I knew she'd give her soul for a drink. The idea came to me when Uncle Elliot made such a fuss about the stuff. I hated it, but I pretended it was wonderful. I knew if she had a chance, she'd never resist. That's why I offered to give her a wedding dress. I made up my mind that if I found Sophie had not touched the bottle, I'd make the best of things and try to be friends with her. That's true, I swear it. When I came back and saw the bottle was empty, I knew I'd been right all along. That's pretty much what I thought. Sophie's dead. Her body was found in the harbor at Toulon. She'd been murdered. Oh, how horrible. Do they know who did it? No. But I do. There's no need to be shocked about Sophie any longer, Isabel. I've had the feeling all day that Sophie is where she would want to be most. Bob and Linda. Oh, I know it's a very usual and simple way to look at it, but... it's comforting. Goodbye, Isabel. And take good care of Gray. He needs you now more than ever.
He's gone. I know. I've lost him. Lost him for good. And I love him. I love him so tenderly. Now I've lost him. Do you suppose we'll ever see him again? It isn't likely. His America will be as remote from yours as the Gobi Desert. It's all so crazy, so useless. What is he trying to do with his life? What does he hope to find? My dear, Larry has found what we all want and very few of us ever get. I don't think anyone can fail to be better and nobler, kinder for knowing him. You see, my dear, goodness is, after all, the greatest force in the world. 